Well, good morning once again. I'm, I'm already feeling more Presbyterian, so we uh, should be good to go. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump right into the scripture, and then we'll do a little introductory remarks in a moment. Um, so our scripture passage for today is Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The word of the Lord. Let me pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Amen. Well, Pastor Andy mentioned just a little bit that I lead a ministry called J17 Ministries, and it's based on a prayer. So I'm excited that I get to be here as part of a Lenten series that's all about prayer. Ask, seek, and knock. Our mission statement in John 17 Ministries is to unite the body of Christ for a divided world. Sound like we got any work left to do on, on that one? <clears throat> um, full disclosure, Pastor Andy is an esteemed member of our board of directors. Esteemed was the word you wanted me to use, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think esteemed. Yeah, 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 okay, good. Um, <clears throat> I, I love this series, and when, when Pastor Andy in, invited me to be a part of it and share with you, um, he, he wrote this, and I, I copied it because I love the way he said it. How we respond to Jesus in ways that bring change into us and into the world. That is so true, and that's what the world needs. Um, a, a week and a half ago, 10 days ago, I had the opportunity to be in Dallas with a group of folks who, uh, get this, the, the, it was a small group, and the purpose of that gathering was to envision together if the body of Christ in our country, the whole country, were to be organized around Jesus' prayer in John 17, that we would all be one, what would that even look like? <laughs> it was heaven. It was such an amazing and transformational time that literally my week this last week was different than it would have been uh, two weeks ago. My calendar was different this week than it was last week because of the transformational time of that prayer. And uh, I, simply listening to Jesus is a lifelong transformational opportunity. It never gets old. It never gets old. I'll be 60 next Sunday, week from today, which still puts me a little younger than Pastor Andy. Just saying. <clears throat> um, and and it, 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 it never gets old. It gets better every year. Um, now, I could, I could talk for 45 minutes about that. I could talk for 45 minutes about most of the screens, the, the slides that are going to be up on the screen. And Pastor Andy said you would like that if, if I did that. So, 
So the reason that I mention that is because already I can feel the prayers rising in, in the room. You're, you're, you're praying, Lord, please show him when to stop. Please help him know when he's done. Please help him remember where he is and stop talking. I can feel it already. It's beautiful. All right, here we go. <clears throat> there are two Lord's prayers. There's two of them. Um, Jesus taught us to ask, seek, and knock. And the disciples asked Jesus one time, um, Master, Rabbi, teach us how to pray. <laughs> that was such a great request. Such a great request. Um, I, I just saw yesterday on, on Facebook, one of our friends, another pastor in the city, had a, uh, a, a picture up and it said the real reason why Jesus went away to pray. And it had the, the disciples around him and it had captions over each of the disciples. Stop touching me. You started it. I want to be first. No, you should. It, <laughs> that's the real reason Jesus went away to pray. <laughs> The disciples got it wrong more often than they got it right. <laughs> but this time they got it right. Teach us how to pray. And the Lord's Prayer, the one that he taught, was Jesus' answer to that question. We prayed it already in this service. So there's the Lord's Prayer that he taught, but there's also the Lord's Prayer that he prayed. And that would be John 17. That's not the only prayer that he prayed, but it's the most developed one. It's the longest prayer of Jesus in the Bible. And so let me just ask you a question. If we pray what Jesus prayed, if we pray how Jesus prayed, do you suppose there's a good possibility that God would say yes to such a prayer? <laughs> Seems reasonable to me. That if we dive deeper into what Jesus prayed and how Jesus prayed, um, we will be well aligned with the Father in heaven. So here's the game plan for this morning. We're going to take a quick look at how Jesus asked, sought, and knocked in John 17. Then we're going to do a quick picture of what that prayer actually looks like, and then we'll come back to the question, the two groups who desperately need Jesus' prayer in John 17 answered. Sound good? Good answer, because that's the plan, whether it sounds good or not. So here we go. Um, there is a, uh, this picture um, is, I, I, my wife and I took it when we were in uh, the Holy Land about five years ago, five and a half years ago. And this is taken from the roof looking toward the Temple Mount. If you look real close, you can see the Dome of the Rock. Um, it, looking toward the Temple Mount from the roof of the most likely site of the upper room. We know within a couple of hours when Jesus prayed John 17. It was Thursday night before Good Friday. It would have been after the meal, but before Gethsemane. So, so we can narrow it down to a couple of hours, and it's very possible that that's where he prayed it. Maybe even looking in that direction. We don't know that for sure, but we can narrow it down pretty closely. So let's, what kind of unity did Jesus pray for? And this is one of those that I could talk about a lot. So I'm gonna just use a, an experience from last week as a way of talking about this description. So let's go to that next slide. The first thing that we learn about the kind of unity that Jesus prayed for is it's unity, not uniformity. He said, may they be one like you and I, Father, are one. Jesus and the Father in that moment were not identical, but they were completely in union. So they, they weren't alike, but they were aligned. That's the kind of unity that Jesus is praying for. My appreciation for the diversity that Jesus intends in the world continues to grow. And so a week ago, I was on a prayer call, with uh, a Zoom call, with about 30 people 
from around the world. It was pointed out, and there were only about 30 of us, it was pointed out towards the end of that prayer call that every continent on the planet was on the call except Antarctica. We didn't have anybody from Antarctica. <clears throat> but every other continent, believers in Jesus from every other continent were on that call. It was amazing. There was a woman from India who was praying about, uh, about persecution for the Christian church in India while my phone was dinging from my friend in Pakistan who's a pastor who's being persecuted in Pakistan. And so my new friend from India <laughs> prayed for my pastor friend from Pakistan in real time while I was on the call. Then there was another a guy from Colombia. He was 22 years old in a room of 180 young people, average age 22. And he said, do you see the people who are standing? Yeah. Those are people, it was about a third of the room. Those are people who are answering Jesus' call to give their life as a follower of his, as a missionary in South Asia from Colombia. That is awesome. That's the kind of unity that Jesus is praying for. It's a public unity, not a private unity. It needs to be bigger than just the love for we, that we have for one another in rooms like this. It's got to be bigger than that. So the reason I was on that call um, was because a new friend of mine, Olivier Fleury from Switzerland, is working with the vision, and I could share so much about this, but I won't, I won't. Um, <clears throat> I could share so much, but the vision of what the 2000th anniversary of Jesus' resurrection could look like. Now, there, there seems to be consensus that we're going to celebrate that in 2033. That's only nine years from now. We'll be alive, most of us. Most of us. Um, we'll, be, we'll be alive in, in, nine, <laughs> in, in nine years. Um, and uh, and we, that'll be the largest celebration in human civilization in every city in every country on every continent and it would be criminal if that celebration was restricted to private celebrations inside the four walls of congregations it's got to be public our unity has got to be big enough that everybody in tucson gets to see it that's what we're praying for. It's a substantive unity, not a spineless unity. In verse 17 of John 17, Jesus prays, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. This is a Jesus-centered, biblically-shaped unity. It's not the world's unity where they say, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere, which if you just poke at it for about five seconds is complete garbage. Of course it matters what we believe. Um, this is a Jesus-centered, biblically-shaped unity. It's timeless. It's not time-bound. In verse 20 of John chapter 17, Jesus specifically prays for us. Like literally us. He says, may all who, 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 I'm not just praying for those who are here, those who will ever believe in me through their witness. That's us right now. This is his prayer for every group of people in every generation, in every locale. And then verse 23 lets us know that it's not the end goal, it's the means to the end. The end goal is so that the world would know who Jesus is, and how much God loves him. That's the purpose of unity. So that's what Jesus is praying about. That will transform the world, and it'll transform us too. Let's go to the next slide. It, Jesus also, in the prayer, shows us how unity actually happens. There's only four things he asks. Oh, ask, seek, knock. There's only four of them in this prayer. Um, that the Son would be glorified, that we would be protected from the enemy, 
that we would be sanctified in the truth, the verse I just read, and that we would be made one. Those are the only four things. So some other time, if you invite me back, I would love to unpack that and show you how easy it is to remember, how it'll completely and totally transform your prayer life, and how it'll change the world around you. Now, do you see what I just did there? It was a shameless plug for you to invite me back. It was shameless. Because Martin Luther, one of his most famous quotes was, sin boldly. That's what he said. Sin boldly, but believe more boldly still. So that's what I just did. Are you good? Okay. All right, here we go. So uh, let's go to the next slide. I want to show you a picture of John 17 in action. I need to explain my picture. That looks like a dead guy, and that is not my intent. <laughs> I just wanted a picture of a body that showed body parts that was okay to show in, in a public setting. So that's the best I could do. <clears throat> so um, 1 Corinthians 12 is one of many, many places in the New Testament where it talks about the church as the body of Christ. That's the most common analogy for the church in the New Testament. The church is like a body. And there is no better picture of unity than a human body. So, so I already discovered, I, I wasn't sure if questions from the pulpit in a Presbyterian church were always rhetorical. I wondered, but Andy asked some and you all answered, so you got to answer these two. These are not complicated questions. Who's the head? Jesus. Who's the parts? Us. A little more specific. Who's the parts? So Presbyterian, Lutheran, Baptist, Pentecostal, that would be one way to answer that. Who else is the parts? Older folks, middle-aged folks, younger folks, children. Um, African-American, Anglo, Latino, Asian, Native American. There's a lot of different ways that we can talk about the parts. All of those count, all right? Next question, do you want in a body, do you want your parts identical or do you want them diverse? You want them diverse. A body that was all eyeballs would not be very attractive. <clears throat> That wouldn't work very well. You want them diverse. Do you want the body parts strong or weak? You want them strong. It's, it's a false humility when we go into a room full of people and say, oh, I, I don't have much to offer. I'm just little old me. That's a false humility because you're still focused on you. <laughs> Humility is when we think, we don't think of ourselves so often. It's not about us. We, we all have something strong to offer. Individually, congregationally, denominationally, ethnically, geographically. We all have something to offer that the whole body needs. You want strong parts. Do you want your body parts working independently or together? Yeah, independently would be called amputation, and there's nothing attractive about that. You want the parts working together. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, the Bible says. That's how they work together. They each have strength, but they're submitting to each other. Okay, last question. Do you want the parts going rogue and staging a coup against the head? That would be no. <clears throat> We don't want that to happen. <laughs> but, but part of what made that time in Dallas so transformational is that the guy who was facilitating it confessed. He said, there are so many times that I will, I'll, I'll start well. I'm, I'm like, Lord, what do you want? And then I'll fill in the gaps in Christ's leadership. Well, guess what? There aren't any gaps <laughs> in Christ's leadership. But how often do we say, Lord, what would you like me to do today? Great, I've got it from here. If I need anything else, I'll check in. We just filled in the gaps in Jesus' leadership.
The head of the body knows where the body is supposed to go, how it's supposed to get there, when it's supposed to move. The head of the body is better equipped than any of us to direct our steps. And the more we learn about that, the more we're transformed and the world around us is transformed. So now we can ask the question, what are the two groups of people who desperately need this prayer of Jesus in John 17 to be answered? You want to guess? Okay, here they are. These are the two groups of people who desperately need Jesus' prayer for the unity of his body to be answered. Us and them. Those are the two groups. Them is the world around us who are not yet followers of Jesus. They desperately need that prayer answered because according to Jesus, unity is the strategy for fulfilling the Great Commission. That's not my idea. <laughs> That's John 17, 23. It's also in John 13 and John 15 and most of the books of the New Testament. <laughs> the world needs that prayer answered because it's how they're going to come to know. But we need it answered just as bad because here's the takeaway. Unity is the process by which we achieve maturity. Unity is how we mature. So let's go back to Ephesians 4, and I'll walk us through it and just make a few comments as we go. So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, different denominations interpret that differently. Uh, I, I actually honestly don't know if Presbyterians use the terminology of the fivefold leadership gifts, but some denominations do on a regular basis. And what's interesting to me is in the New Testament, um, the starting point when you think church is never a local congregation, it's always the church in a city. So I'm not at all convinced that this is saying that within every congregation, there should be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But within the city church, there absolutely need to be. Next verse. To equip his people for works of service. The purpose of leadership in the body of Christ is never to do the ministry. It's to equip the rest of the body to do the ministry. We can't hog the ministry and do it ourselves we're, our job is, is to equip everybody else to do the ministry so that the body of Christ may be built up. That would be a, a language of like maturity. Verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unity in faith and unity in knowledge. It's not one or the other, it's both. We need unity in knowledge, doctrine. We need unity in faith, belief, and trust. We need, we need both of those. And unity, that very next phrase, leads to maturity. Out of our unity, we become mature. How mature are we supposed to become? Well, what's the end of verse 13? Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Phrased another way, until the body of Christ today looks like the body of Christ literally 2,000 years ago when it was Jesus. The collective body of Christ, the church, is supposed to look like Jesus when he was walking the earth. Do you suppose that one of the reasons why so many people in our country are, are not followers of Jesus is because they've never seen a whole Jesus? They've just seen parts. And, and, and the parts are often arguing with each other, just like the first disciples did. So they say, no thanks. But if we could look like all of Jesus, that would be a lot more attractive. 
And more people would say, yes, I receive what you gave me. And I want to follow you. Okay, verse 14. Um, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Everything in that verse is talking about immaturity. Immaturity in doctrine, immaturity in belief, immaturity in following. Unity is how we get to maturity. Verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. We need to get to a place where we love one another and trust one another enough that I can say, Andy, you, you, you got something on your teeth right there. It's not very attractive. And Andy would say, thank you for pointing that out. And of course, that would be true on much more consequential things than just something in your teeth. We'll mature if we love and trust one another enough that we can point out things that need our attention. Verse 16, from him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So let me summarize that whole passage. Here's what Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 says, in my humble opinion. We don't know what we don't know. That's called blind spots. <laughs> and, and we're not going to know what we don't know. We're not going to have our blind spots revealed until we do unity, until we answer Jesus' prayer, until we look like a body that doesn't have missing parts, until we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, until we speak the truth in love, until we surround ourselves with those whose life experience differs dramatically from our own. I'm almost done, I promise. So here's one really short example of how that's working in Tucson. 12 years ago, and 12 years ago, almost this month, an African-American pastor came to me. I had started to build a relationship with him. And here's essentially what he said. Could we, African-American pastors and Anglo pastors, could we get together and is our unity in Christ sufficient that we could talk politics and live to tell about it? That was essentially the question. I'm happy to share in the details if you want them. I'll be at the table. Um, The answer to that is an astounding yes. That group started meeting during another presidential election campaign 12 years ago. We've been meeting together every month since then, and I have never been in a group that has revealed more of my blind spots and produced more growth and maturity than that group of people every month for 12 years now. That's what it's supposed to look like. Now, not everybody is going to be like jumping out of their chairs right now saying, sign me up. But some of you might be. (laughs) And so I just want to encourage you, if you are sensing a call to dive deeper into this John 17 prayer, please come talk to me at the red table out there on the patio, because we've got a number of resources that can help with that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the way that you asked, sought, and knocked. Thank you for the incredible opportunity that we have to follow in your footsteps and do what you did. And we pray that you would so transform us, even by the ways that we pray and the things that we pray about, that we would start to look more like you look to the world around us. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen.